Hi everybody and welcome back to Miss Angler's biology class. I am Miss Angler. In today's video we are going to do a past paper exam question on pedigree diagrams and the genetics that's responsible for that. Now if you are new here don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and make sure you are subscribed with your notifications turned on because I post every Tuesday and Thursday. I am starting a new series for IEB students as well where I'm going to be doing their past paper questions as well. Now if you are an IEB student watching this video then this video is still applicable to you. You can still do these questions but I think sometimes it's nice to also see some questions that come up in your exams so look out for those videos as well. Now this particular question that I chose I feel is on a medium level of difficulty. I don't think it is too challenging. However, I do sometimes think that students get flustered when they do a pedigree diagram and they're not so sure how to interpret it and I think that's where everything goes wrong. Now this particular question is an unseen genetic problem which means you might not have heard of the genetic disorder before. So let's read the question. It says the diagram below shows the inheritance of Tay-Sachs, a rare disease which leads to the destruction of neurons. It is inherited as an autosomal disorder and it is controlled by two alleles, a capital T and a lowercase t. Now at the very beginning here this is some very important information. Number one, when we see autosomal we know that we're going to be using um, capital letters and lowercase letters on their own and they tell us what those letters are as well. Now, what is interesting, though, is they don't actually tell us, is this a dominant disorder or is this a recessive disorder? They don't. Um, all they do is they say it's controlled by two alleles, a capital T and a lowercase t. And so now what's interesting is we have to actually figure out whether or not this is a dominant or a recessive condition. Now, speaking from experience and looking at this picture, the first thing that pops into my head is this more than likely, and I will prove it now to you, is a recessive um, disorder. Now, ma'am, how did you know that just by looking at the picture? Well, I just want to show you something about um, frequency in genetics. Now, if you have a look at the key down here, you will see that everyone who is colored in is someone who has the disease and everyone who is not colored in is, is without it. Now, the fact that there are only two individuals, which is individual seven and individual five, they are the only ones who has the disorder. Because that frequency is so low compared to the total amount of individuals in this family tree, that leads me to believe that it's recessive. But why, ma'am? Well, if it was a dominant disorder, and let's use the letters that they have provided, if it was dominant, these are the three possible letter combinations that you can get. If this was a dominant disorder, there are two possible outcomes here that could produce the disorder, which means there's about a two out of three chance or a more than a 60 to 75 percent chance that you're going to have it, which means if this was the case, we would see a lot more individuals colored in because the proportion would be higher. And that is because of the law of dominancy. Um, because, if you remember, you only need one capital T to have a disorder if it's dominant, right? But because this disorder seems to be controlled by a recessive allele, you have a much, much smaller possibility or a 30 to 33% chance of having it. And that's why we see such few frequencies in this disorder. And that leads me to come to the conclusion that this is a recessive disorder. Now what you need to do is, and I tell this to all my metrics, you need to fill in the alleles that you are certain of. So we're going to go on our picture here and we're going to fill in every one that we're certain of. So 7 and 5 are both definitely two lowercase t's. As we, as we have established now, this is a recessive disorder. So to have the disorder, you must have two lower cases, and these two individuals will not have. Remember, um, even though it says male with and female without and that kind of thing, that doesn't mean it is a gonosomal or a sex-linked cross. Remember, it told you it was autosomal, so that's why there's no X's and Y's here. 
Everybody else, though, is up for debate or it's up for discussion. Now, everybody here doesn't have the disorder. So that means at minimum, each of the individuals in this family tree will have at least one capital T allele or one dominant allele. But now we have to figure out what the other possible allele is. Now, in order to work out individual one and two, we are going to look at their children. And the key here is actually number five. Because number five is homozygous recessive, that means that it would have gotten one small T from dad and one small T from mom. And we've now completed who one and two are. But now we need to look at their children. And their children are a little bit more complicated because six, for example, could have inherited a capital T from dad and a capital T from mom because they're present in both one and two. Or it could have inherited a capital T and a lowercase t, because that's also a possibility from these parents. And the same can be said for individual four. However, before I go on on, on individual four, we can look at number seven to tell us what three and four are. Because number seven is two lowercase t's and the parents don't have the disorder, it's very safe to say that they are both recessive alleled parents. Now that we have filled out our whole question, now we can comfortably go into our questions and we can walk you through how to get full marks. Number one, it says describe what is meant by an autosomal disorder. It's only for two marks, so literally all we are writing here is the key points. One, you are talking about the autosomes, which are chromosomes number one to 22. And all you're going to do is you're going to mention that all these alleles that are on chromosome 1 to 22 are found on autosomes and that's it that's all you are describing if if a disease or a disorder occurs on any allele f um, on chromosomes 1 to 22 it is an autosomal disorder very simple answer don't overthink it now Number two says, how many sons do individuals one and two have? That's very easy. We're going to look for all the boys. So let's color in the boys. Um, we have got one son here at number six. And that's it. Their, their other two children are girls. So that's pretty easy. Next question. Number three says, using individuals three, seven, uh, three, four, and seven, explain why it can be concluded that Tay-Sachs disease is controlled by a recessive allele. And what you're going to do there for five marks, which is a lot of marks if you think about it, is you are going to talk about what the parents are, each for a mark. So let me walk you through how to best break this question down. So for your first mark, you're going to tell me what mom is. Okay, and she is capital T, lower T. Then for your second mark, you're going to tell me what dad is. And he is also capital T, lowercase t. Then you're going to tell me what the child is, which in this case is two lowercase t's. Now you're three out of five. You're almost there. Now for the last two remaining marks, you are going to use the law of segregation. Now, why, ma'am? Because the law of segregation says that you can inherit only one allele from each parent, and that's going to get you your first tick, to form an offspring that has only one of each in each gamete. So each gamete gets that second tick, and that is what produces this offspring with two lowercase t's. Now, we can use this explanation for any kind of inheritance question where they ask you, um, explain the inheritance from parents two and four, or explain the inheritance seen in the offspring at number seven using the parents. And all you're doing is you're saying, what is mom? What is dad? What did I give to the child? So what is the child? What do they have? And how did they get it? Well, they got it due to the law of segregation. And you explain the law of segregation. And by the way, a top tip for everyone, you should be using your exam guideline to define the law of segregation because that is what they expect you to use in the final exam, not what's in your textbook, not what you might have written down in your notes. Now, last but not least, for number four, it says individuals one and two can produce children with three possible genotypes. 
Okay, this is interesting information, and it is true. They can do that. List all the genotypes that have a 25% chance of being produced. Now, what a lot of us are going to do, and I suggest this, is we go off on a spare piece of paper or in pencil, and we make a quick little Punnett square here. And we already calculated what individuals 1 and 2 are. So I'm actually just going to pop them in the Punnett square here now, and I'm going to do a quick cross to show you what's possible. So those are all our possible outcomes. And they're asking to list all the genotypes that have a 25% chance of being produced. So let's have a look here. First of all, who's our first group that can come out 25%? Well, it's definitely going to be two lowercase t's. Another one that's going to have a 25% chance is the two capital T's. But Unfortunately, or fortunately, our last group is 50%, so we don't want that for our answer. We want to focus on those two. So our final answer for number 2.5.4 is we are going to have the alleles TT, that's the first genotype, two capital T's, and then two lowercase t's. Those are our two possible 25% chances. Now, as always, I like to show you the memo at the end of this, and I'd like you to just go through and have a look. Um, pay special attention to 253. That's because there is an or here, which means if you are going to answer, all your ticks must come from this answer or it must come from this answer. You're not allowed to mix and match. In other words, you can't have two ticks from here and the remaining three from down here. That is not possible. So just keep that in mind when you read memos. And the one that we did is very similar to this particular answer over here. Another thing that I want you to pay careful attention to, and sometimes when we read memos, we overlook this when we see very long answers here is that we don't see exactly what I've said, you know, in the previous explanation for 253. I want you to know that this memo here is, uh, let's call it learner friendly. And it is not exactly as what we use at the end of the year. And what that means is, it's not that we change the memo, we don't change the memo, but we know that students don't always write the same thing in the same way that's in the memo. So you've also got to be able to interpret the memo. And I just want to show you what that means. Do you see it says here individuals three and four are both without Tay-Sachs? That's when you're telling me what parents are. So remember when I said to you, tell me what mom is and tell me what dad is? Didn't I say earlier that that was going to get you a mark? Likewise with the next one, the child has Tay-Sachs. Didn't I tell you you need to tell me what the child is? So you've got to be able to interpret your answer and see, are you saying something that means the same? Now, if you like this video, everyone, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, and I will see you all again soon. Good luck with your exams if you are writing now. Bye.